so this next presentation is um, specifically about how our food systems in any country can cope or adapt or transform in response to this new emerging global challenge of phosphorus scarcity. So very specific. And just for those who aren't familiar with phosphorus, a bit of a, a phosphorus um, 101, if you like. Um, like oxygen, nitrogen, um, and carbon, phosphorus is essential building block of all life, so essential for all living organisms, and it has no substitute in food production. So there's always going to be a global demand for phosphorus. Chemical fertilisers, including phosphorus, nitrogen and potassium, have certainly contributed to feeding billions of people over the past um, half century by boosting crop yields. But the problem is today modern agriculture depends largely on one main source of phosphorus, which is phosphate rock, and that's a non-renewable resource that's becoming increasingly scarce um, and expensive. If we step back um, 200 years, we can actually see that um, if you go back to the, the green here in the 1800s, um, there was no such thing as chemical fertilisers. Farmers relied on, on local organic sources such as um, animal, animal manure or in some parts of the world, particularly in Asia, for thousands of years, the use of um, human excreta has been used. And guano, which has fossilised bird or bat droppings, um, was discovered um, over 100 years ago um, off the coast of Peru and um, in the South Pacific, down in our region here. Um, but it's a tiny black blip on that line and you can actually see a little be uh, peak uh, guano. And phosphate rock was actually discovered roughly around the same time, but as you can see from the picture, it was really only until after the post-World War II period, um, keeping up with the, the Green Revolution and urbanisation and, and other gro growth, that the demand for phosphate rock and therefore the, um, the production um, really skyrocketed. And what it means today is that we're essentially dependent on this one main source. And at the time, it was just seen as a cheap, easily available, uncomplicated source. The future demand for phosphorus is somewhat uncertain, but we do know that demand is increasing. Obviously, more mouths to feed, um, changing diets, particularly what we're seeing in, um, in China and, and India. More meat-based diets and dairy-based diets require more fertilisers. There's still many parts of the world that have phosphorus-deficient soils that we need to, to increase um, the soil fertility. Um, and then there's, of course, the non-food um, uses. Even though 90% of phosphate rock is currently used for food production, there are a few other uses which could grow. And as we know, the first generation biofuel crops required a lot of fertilisers. And if you look at the demand for phosphorus, um, but specifically around 2007, you can actually see a, a, um, a stepped increase associated with U, um, US ethanol policy at the time. Um, and then there's other sources um, or other uses, such as electric vehicle batteries. So lithium ion phosphate batteries are one of the most um, promising batteries, yet they have 60 kilograms of phosphate in every battery. So we need to start thinking about where we're going to use phosphorus for and what the implications are for food security. In 2008, along with the, the food price crisis and the oil price crises, um, the price of phosphate rock also spiked 800%. And like these other, other crises, it did lead to um, farmer riots and indeed suicides in some parts of the world. But if anything good can come out of a crisis, it's really that it, it raised awareness about this global phosphorus issue um, and just demonstrated how um, fragile and vulnerable our food system is, even to a short-term um, fluctuation in the supply of phosphorus. So what are these different dimensions of phosphorus scarcity? Well, the first one that obviously comes to mind is physical scarcity, and you might have heard of peak phosphorus, very controversial, more so than peak oil, some would argue. Um, and that suggests that global demand for phosphorus fertilisers is likely to surpass supply this century. And there's now been um, a lot more studies done on this topic, which together suggest that this could be between 2035 and 2075. And while there is some uncertainty and, of course, some debate around that, um, what is widely acknowledged and recognised is that the quality of remaining phosphate rock that we have left in the world is in decline. We have used up the good stuff and the cheap stuff. And that also means access, physical access, is becoming more difficult. We're having to dig deeper under the seabed for the first time. This means more energy and the total costs are increasing of mining and, and producing fertilisers and the amount of waste is um, increasing as well along with that. But perhaps the most um, important and concerning dimension of phosphorus scarcity is the geopolitically induced scarcity. So remembering that all farmers need access to phosphorus, we have a situation which is um, worse than oil, where just five countries control 85% of the world's remaining phosphate rock. 
And indeed, one country and one family controls three quarters of the world's remaining phosphate. And I'll tell you in a minute who that is. Um, the US used to be the world's biggest producer, consumer, importer and exporter of phosphate. But now the US has roughly 20, 25 years left of their supplies. Morocco, you might have guessed it, um, has three quarters of the share of the world's main, uh, remaining phosphate. And complicating that picture is some of that is in Western Sahara, which is considered to be illegally occupied by Morocco and against UN resolutions. And then you have China, who's also another major player in the, in the phosphate um, market. And some of you might know that in 2008 they imposed a um, 135% export tariff on their phosphate, which basically halted phosphate um, exports from the region overnight. And when China was just being smart, they were concerned about their own food security and, and food production. So what this means is that whether we're talking about India, Australia, the European Union, um, we're all dependent on imports, and that makes us vulnerable to price fluctuations and any supply disruptions. And further, um, thinking about uh, what's recently been termed blood phosphates, like blood diamonds, this means that companies, farmers and consumers in importing countries um, from Western Saharan phosphate rock are knowingly or unknowingly supporting an illegal occupation, and we do need to think about that issue. And then there's economic scarcity. Farmers, of course, need both short and long-term access to phosphorus fertilisers, or all fertilisers, um, but almost a billion farming families um, lack purchasing power to access fertiliser markets. Um, in Africa, in particular in landlocked countries, some farmers pay two to three times more than their European counterparts because of the, um, the retail and distribution costs, which could be around um, transport, it could be handling and duties, and also um, corruption in some regions. So we can say that there's a silent demand from um, farmers, particularly with low purchasing power in, in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And the African continent itself is a really good um, example or symbol of this phosphorus inequity that we're seeing, where that continent alone has the world's largest by far remaining phosphate rock reserves, but also the lowest soil fertility, some of the poorest farmers, some of the lowest fertiliser application rates by far, orders of magnitude, um, and the highest rates of food insecurity. And then phosphorus is also scarce because it's mismanaged. Um, it's, it's used in the global food system, and you can see here the, the phosphorus budget. I'm not going to go through all those numbers, but basically for those who are unfamiliar, we mine phosphate rock, um, produce fertilisers, they're traded globally, farmers apply those to fields, harvested crops take up the phosphorus that's then produced into food, and we consume um, phosphorus in food, which comes out our other end as, um, in urine and excreta, in uh, faeces. But what I wanted to point out here is that while we're consuming 3 million tonnes of phosphorus each year in the food we eat, we're mining five times that amount, specifically for food production. So we have 80% of losses throughout the system, and this is a really, really high number, and the losses occur at all the phases of the food system. And where do they end up? Well, a large fraction of those losses end up in our waterways from China to the Great Barrier Reef um, to the Great Lakes of the US. And we know that that can cause um, eutrophication or nutrient pollution, which can lead to algal blooms and can kill entire fish and aquatic life. Um, and it's certainly a, a global issue. Given the criticality and scarcity of phosphorus, it's, um, it's quite bizarre, if you like, that there's such a lack of effective um, global phosphorus governance because there's no um, international or national policies, guidelines or organisations that are currently responsible for ensuring long-term availability and accessibility to phosphorus for food production. We often hear that um, the market, of course, will take care of it, but as Melissa pointed out, um, that's not going to be sufficient um, to ensure equitable, timely and sustainable management um, for food security and for, for phosphorus as a subset of, of achieving food security. So whose responsibility is phosphorus, long-term phosphorus security? Um, the go governance of phosphorus is currently fragmented between uh, many different stakeholders and sectors, from the mining industry right down to the sanitation sector. So is it the mining and fertiliser companies, investors perhaps, farmers, food retailers, consumers, the wastewater service providers or the UN? Well, as you probably guessed, the answer is yes. Further complicating this picture is a number of um, phosphorus dichotomies. So at the global scale, we can see phosphorus as both scarce and polluting. 
And we know um, food security also has these dichotomies around one billion obese and one, one billion undernourished as well. And that the dis distribution of phosphate reserves is marked by very few producers and the rest of the world being importers. In terms of fertiliser use, there's still a lot of over-application of fertilisers in some parts of the world or some farms and under-application in other areas. Some soils have surplus phosphorus, as you can see in the red in the, in the map, while others are phosphorus deficient and require increased phosphorus. For some farmers in the world, access to fertilisers is the biggest issue, while for others it's managing excess to reduce um, losses and runoff to, to waterways. And in terms of fertiliser demand, um, it's actually decreasing in some parts of the world, specifically in Europe and North America and Japan, because of decades of over-application, which has led to a lot of this nutrient pollution that we're seeing. While in other parts of the world, specifically um, emerging economies, that demand is increasing and the overall trajectory is an increase. It's also important to remember that while all countries are exposed to these same global drivers that I've started to point out, um, the vulnerability and indeed the ability to um, adapt and transform is very context specific and depends on local factors like farmers' purchasing power or the status of um, soil fertility or um, the status of infrastructure in those countries as well. And even in this country, it's quite interesting because we like to see ourselves as you know, a food secure um, region um, and indeed a net exporter of food and um, the potential future food bowl of Asia but we're actually a net phosphorus importer. And interestingly, we're the world's fifth largest importer of phosphate, um, which is um, quite significant given we're such a, a small country. Um, and the reason for this is that we have naturally phosphorus deficient soils, but at the same time, we've invested quite heavily in phosphorus intensive agricultural export industries like producing beef and wheat and live animal um, exports and, and dairy. And so that means we're literally shipping the phosphorus off our shores um, in those exports, leaving us quite vulnerable to some of these um, global drivers that we're seeing. So what's quite clear is that if we don't change the current trajectory, we are going to reach um, a hard landing situation of increasing energy costs, waste, more volatile prices, geopolitical tensions and more conflict, reduce farm access to fertilisers and reduce crop yields and therefore increasing um, food insecurity. So how might we think more about a, a sustainable trajectory? Um, and the definition of phosphorus security is one way and quite similar to, to food security definition. Um, phosphorus security ensures that all farmers have short and long term access to phosphorus to produce enough food to feed the world while ensuring ecosystem integrity and livelihood security of farmers and other communities. And the good news is it is possible to avert a crisis, uh, but there will be no single solution, again, as Melissa has um, spoken to us about. And even if we just look at the demand and supply situation for phosphorus, um, we can see that there's a whole suite of options that we can essentially fill the gap between the growing demand for phosphorus and the decreasing um, dependency that we need to put on phosphate rock. And in the blue, you see a range of efficiency and demand side measures, and in the red, a whole range of um, recycling and supply side measures, because we can actually recycle phosphorus from um, all organic sources um, at all stages of the food system. And continuing that, you can see there's actually a whole toolbox of these options, and here's just 70 that we currently know about, and they're just examples. So you can see from all sectors in mining and fertiliser industry to agriculture to the livestock sector of food production um, and the wastewater um, sector, there's a lot of interventions that we can, we can do here. And they're as vast as um, increasing mining efficiency um, because we're doing the same sort of processes that we're doing for the past 50 years, or it can be um, incentives to, to help farmers apply the right amount of phosphorus at the right time um, where the crop actually needs it. Or it can be around um, changing diets, globally changing diets towards more um, phosphorus friendly and climate friendly um, foods. And then in the bottom picture you can see um, a farmer in Ghana who's used um, urine to grow um, his onions and you can, you can tell which one has been fertilised with, uh, with urine. So there's a whole suite of measures and even just in the wastewater sector there's about 30 to 50 different technologies by which we could recover phosphorus and use it efficiently, high tech and low tech. That's um, relevant to many different parts of the world. So just summing up that, um, I do believe that achieving phosphorus security and hence feeding over 9 billion people is possible um, if industry innovates, for example, creating um, efficient renewable fertilisers, much like the energy sector, 
Um, if researchers identify as scientifically and socially credible phosphorus technologies and practices, if policymakers stimulate and support context-specific and sustainable initiatives, and consumers or um, citizens are enabled to choose sustainable and healthy diets. And I just wanted to briefly mention the Global Phosphorus Research Initiative, which we co-founded in 2008, to really respond to this um, emerging um, crisis for food security. And we undertake um, everything from research to um, policy engagement to communication um, to, to further advance uh, this issue towards action. And, and we do believe that it's going to be a multi-stakeholder approach. So thank you very much. Thank you.